Psalm 42, the psalmist said, As a heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Verse number 4, When I remember these things, I poured out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. I love that verse. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and the Hermonites from the hill of Mizar. Verse number seven. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. David's having a hard time, isn't he? Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. Somebody say amen. amen. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Hmm. As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance, and my God, I love that. For who's the health of my countenance, my appearance, the way that I appear, the way that I look, he is the health of that. Right. Amen. David is saying my face is a reflection of what's going on in my spirit, but he said I am going to hope in him who is the health of my countenance. He's going to turn this around. And it's going to reflect not only in the things that are going on privately in my life, but others are going to be able to look at my countenance and see that I am healthy. Talking about spiritually healthy, all right? My God, how awesome is that? Now, I know that our church in particular, with everything that's gone on, and everything that we've talked about, and everything that we bragged about, and, it, and I hope you understand that it's all about Jesus. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Everything is about Jesus. Everything that's going on is about the Lord. Amen. We that have worked around here, those that have given, it's not just so we can stand up and brag and, and all of that, but the house of God has needed attention and it's getting attention and it's all about the Lord. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Now, any time that you see that going on. Anytime you see people moving together and pulling together, working in the kingdom of God, praying for the Lord's will to be done, seeking God, inviting family and friends to come. I know that our world is turned upside down. I understand that. But you know what? There always have been and there always will be looking for the Lord. They always have been. There's something within the human race. There's something within us that only God can fill. There's a void that only he can fill. Amen. And whenever they see people actively working, actively praying, actively involved in building and establishing the kingdom of heaven, no matter how large or how small the church, when they see the unity of the brethren, Amen. It catches their attention. And the anointing of God rests in that place and in that position. No matter if it's our church or the church down the road, our denomination or some other denomination, doesn't make any difference. Denomination has nothing to do with it. Amen. Because it is the body of Christ. Amen. That is a reflection of the glory of God and the presence of God in this earth. Amen. Now, we live in a time when the, there are those that are outside that are asking, where is God at in all of this? Why, if God is so involved, why, if God loves us so much, why uh, is our children afflicted with this COVID? Why 
Uh, have we lost friends and family members and neighbors? Why is somebody uh, living that should not have lived and others are dying that were young enough we would have thought they would have beat this situation? Amen. You see what I'm saying? And so the enemy jumps up and he begins to scream in our ear, where is he at? Now those of us that are believers, we understand that God is all-knowing, God is all uh, powerful and God is always present. Amen. He's always present. Even when I don't feel his presence, he's still there. When I don't recognize him there, he's still there. Are you with me this evening? He said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you, but I'll go with you always, even till the end of the age. Would somebody say a good amen to that? And so the enemies of the church would come and they would, they would close down every church church they could in this country of ours is preaching the truth of the gospel and take the preachers from behind the pulpit and lock them in jail if they could. They would take away our Bibles and shut down the understanding of the word of God. That our children would never be able to hear those ancient stories that build faith and confidence in a God, amen, that's told them that he loves them and sent his son to die for them. Amen. The devil will come to you in those times times of sickness and, and distress and he'll say well you believe that by his stripes you're healed why aren't you healed amen you believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son where is he at in this situation why is there so many sick among you amen amen and you still uh, uh, go with sickness where is God at now in your life what is going on in your life in times of financial crisis, he'll come and he'll say you believe in tithing? Why are you going to give God your money? Where's God at now? You believe in giving to missions? Why do you believe that the word says giving and shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom? Why are you so uh, strapped financially now? If you really believe that, if God's word is really true, then where's God at in this equation? Amen? And so if we're not careful, we begin to entertain these thoughts in our minds as they consistently bombard our hearts and bombard our minds as we weep over situations we have no control over. And the next thing we know, we're saying, God, amen, I, I, I don't have any defense. There's nothing that I can say. There's nothing that I can do to defend what is going on. The devil comes and he'll say, uh, if God hears your prayers, then why are you in the mess that you're in? Him. Amen. Amen. Satan, by doing so, is trying to shake your faith. He's trying to uh, pull you away from the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. He that wants you to continually stand robustly and pronounce the word of God in the face of opposition, in the face of the enemy. Amen. The devil is a mocker, ladies and gentlemen. He's a usurper. He's a thief and a liar. Would somebody say amen today? And we have to understand where it's coming from and know what the Word of God says to us about our God. Would somebody say amen? amen? If he came to Jesus and said to Jesus, command these stones to be made bread, then we can rest assured he'll come to us. He'll tempt us in much the same way. He tried to shake Jesus in his sonship. And since he was, he was divided from God from eternity, the devil strives on division. Hear what this preacher's telling you tonight. Anytime there's division in the house, God's not in a thousand miles of it. It doesn't make any difference. What is going on? My purpose, my mind, God, I don't want to be the source. I don't want to be the reason behind any kind of division. Amen. I was teasing Sister Judy a while ago, and she knows I was teasing her. But I got her. I understand, brother, what she meant. Amen. If you're going to do it, I'm for her. I said just do it the best you can. I had a little time. They had a little paint. What's wrong with me going by there, dabbing it on there? Amen. Make Sister Judy. Judy feel good, make me feel good, somebody say amen, make the church look good, amen, so there ain't no need in getting bent out of shape, amen, because somebody don't believe just like you believe, amen, now, if we understand that his purpose is to separate us from Christ, 
and he works through division. Then it behooves every born-again child of God, every spirit-filled believer, to purpose in their heart, I'm not going to have any part of that division. Hmm? Now, Brother and Sister Goblin are visiting us here tonight, and I want to publicly say, Brother Goblin, there is no division that I know about in the church. Amen. Some folks think whenever a preacher preaches like this, oh, he's having hell on, over there. Oh, ain't got nothing to do with it. You know what this is? This is preventive maintenance. You go by and squirt the oil on the wheel before it starts squeaking. Somebody say amen right now. See, we understand what the enemy is going to do, and I understand where some of us are. And we talked about my daughter being here this morning. She's still real weak, and she still has hard times. She told me, she said, Dad, I thought I was going to have to leave the service this morning because I couldn't hardly get my breath, and I couldn't hardly breathe. And I'm so glad she got to stay, Brother Doug, because she's a testimony to what God is able to do. Would somebody say amen? But I, I ain't going to lie to you. It made me and Sister Pack feel so good to be able to lay our eyes on her and have her here in the house with us so we can watch her and take care of her until she gets up on her feet. I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I, I'm not going to lie to you. That, that just makes you feel good. But there's so many folks out there that can't do that. They can't do that. And so the enemy comes and says to them, where is God at now in, the, in this situation? I want to give you a few things tonight, and I'm not even going to try to finish this tonight. And if I don't finish it ever, then you'll know that I got a half a sermon preached. Would y'all Would y'all be okay with that? I was going to preach part of it this morning, and Brother Nelson, come back and preach the rest of it tonight, but uh, the Lord took the service this morning. We had sweet communion and, and, and everything, and so I, I concede that. Uh, but, but in Deuteronomy chapter number 4 and verse number 39, notice what the word of the Lord said. He said, Now know therefore this day, and consider it in your heart, that the Lord, He is God. Somebody say Amen. He is God, he said, in heaven above and upon the earth beneath there is none else. Somebody say amen. So when the devil comes to, say, he comes to you and says, where is your God at? The first thing you need to say, he's above me. Would you shout amen? I love that. I love that because, see, there's nothing that happens in my life that he can't see. Amen. And our brother Son, he just came from the Razorback game, and he was sitting up there in the air-conditioned box. Somebody say amen right now. And he, he told me this afternoon that you could just look down over the whole field, and you could see the whole field from where he was at. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? See, it's kind of like God. God is above us. Would you say? You see, we can't get this in our minds sometimes. Sometimes uh, I, see, I see people that want to act like that God is just like they are. But God is so far above us. That he, he's left us in the sand a long time ago. Y'all with me tonight? Amen. His ways are so much higher than my ways. His thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts. But so when the devil comes and says, where is your God at now? Well, I, I just tell you this, Mr. Devil, he's above me. Amen. And I just want to serve notice on you right now that he knows where I'm at. He sees my situation. He recognizes my circumstances. There's nothing caught God by surprise in my life. Somebody say amen. He's above us. He's watching down over us, ladies and gentlemen. Woo, I love that. I love that. I, I like the idea that nothing catches God by surprise. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Pastor, I don't know. Well, that's what the Word of God said. He's above us. Amen. The Bible talks about how that he, the clouds are as the dust of his feet. Would you say amen to that? Ooh, isn't that awesome? Can't you just see God when it starts clouding up, 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 up in the sky? Amen. Can't you just see the Lord get up off the throne and take a stroll across heaven and dust just kicking up behind his feet wherever he's walking? You see what I'm saying? And it's, and it's appearing on our side. It's clouds, but it's just God taking a stroll over heaven. Would you say amen to that? He's so much higher than us. He's so much higher than us. I said he's so much higher than us. His ways are past our finding out. Well, and then in Psalms chapter number 125, verse number 2, he said, As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is around about his people from henceforth even forever. Amen. 
So, Mr. Devil, let me just tell you where my God is at. First of all, he's, a, he's above me. Amen. From that vantage point, Mr. Devil, he sees where I'm at. He recognizes what's going on around me. Amen. And so the second thing, Mr. Devil, not only is he above me, but he's all around me. Somebody say amen right now. Woo, somebody hear me now. You, uh, I mean, you say, well, pastor, it don't feel like he's around me. If he's around me, I wish he'd get where I'm at because I, I you know, no, 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 you, you miss the point. You miss the point. You see, there's only so much that can take place when he's around us. Somebody say amen. How many of you know that he limits the enemy on his attacks? How many of you know that he had to say, have you considered my servant Job? Hallelujah. He's a good man. He's an upright man. He's a righteous man. Amen. God said, I'm going to surround him. And he said, Mr. Devil, you can only do so much. And that's all you can do. Hallelujah. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the day when the Lord picks up the devil by the nap of the neck. Come on now. Y'all know what the nap of the neck is? Uh, that's the part of your neck your mom and daddy used to grab in church whenever you was acting up. And they'd grab you by the nap of the neck and they'd jerk you over there closer to you and say, I'm going to wear you out if you don't straighten up and set right. Amen. You knew what it was. Would you say amen to that? Uh, have you ever seen a Doberman pincher whenever some little old uh, chihuahua dog would be messing with him? I mean, he knows he could just bite the head off of just one bite, but what he does, he'll just reach down, pick him up by the nap of the neck, and shake him real good, and drop him. When he drops him, he, that little old dog runs back up to the porch. Would you say, a man to that? And I'm looking forward to the day when the God who surrounds us, amen, takes that barking dog, the devil, and shakes him by the nap of the neck and says, you've had enough. There's no more. You've got to turn loose. You've got to go. You've got to take your COVID. You've got to take your sickness. You've got to take your disease. You've got to take your lies and your innuendos. And you've got to leave my people alone. Would you say a good amen to that? Now let me just tell you this this morning, ladies and gentlemen. I said it this morning. i got to say it to you again tonight. Uh, there's one thing that I know that COVID has done, and it's caused the church to pray one for another more than I've seen in many a year. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, we got we got prayer requests coming to us from all over folks that I don't even know who they are. I'm constantly telling you, tell me who I can take off the prayer list because it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You hear what I'm saying? And it's not that we don't want to pray, but when God does something for somebody and we can move them off, there's somebody else waiting to take their place. You see what I'm saying? And it's because ladies and gentlemen, the devil knows that he don't have long to work. Would you hear what I'm saying? Amen. And so we need to understand that he's around about us and he sees everything that's going on in our life. Now I love the story that you find in 2 Kings over there, chapter number 6, where the Syrians are warring against the nation of Israel. Now Ben-Hadad he is going to wreak havoc for Israel and every time he'd make a plan, he lied Elisha would warn the children of Israel about what his plans was. Let me just pause right here and tell you, it's good to have a prophet in the midst. Amen. Come on, somebody that can give you the word of God. Amen. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Somebody that'll preach the truth. Somebody that's going to teach you right from wrong. Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> and so Elisha would tell the king of, uh, uh, of Israel what, to, what Ben-Hadad would be up to. And so Ben-Hadad thought naturally he had a spy in the camp. But when he asked, he was told that Israel had a prophet by, who by divine power would tell his intentions and warn Israel. And so thereby give them direction. And so he was going to go and do away with Elisha. That's real. That's real smart, Mr. Devil. <laughs> ah, yeah, God's got his man down there doing what God's called him to do, doing what God's ordained him to do, leading the children through some war time. Somebody say amen. And you're going to go down and you're going to do away with him. Let's just see how that pans out for you. Amen. 
And so he goes down, and you know the story. He's going to do away with Elisha. And he went and he camped around about the city where Elisha was asleep at. And, and now, now let me tell you something. you got to know that Elisha was right with God whenever there's a contract out on his life, and he's going to have a hit man come in or a team of specialized hit people to come in and take his life out, and Elisha's asleep. Would you say amen to that? Now, he's either nuts or he's plugged into the right place. Would you shout a good amen to that? Oh, I want the, I want the world to say that about us. Amen. Huh? You know that bunch down at Lake Hamilton, they either plugged into Jesus or they are absolutely start raving crazy. <laughs> huh? Y'all know what I'm talking about? One of the two, there ain't no, there ain't no middle ground there. They either on the, they're nut, but they're that they're, they're, they're screwed on the right bolt. Somebody say amen right there. Yeah, are, are y'all with me tonight? You understand what I'm saying? They're gonna say something about us, huh? They might as well say that we're either crazy or else God is in our midst, huh? And so whenever he gets down there, uh, Elisha's helper. Uh, he, he gets all upset and uh, his servant woke up and he saw the enemy surrounded them and he was afraid. Now let me just tell you ladies and gentlemen you'll be afraid too when your enemy surrounds you if you're not in the right place. Come on now. You see, you got to know not only that the enemy's surrounding you, but you got to know that God is above you, and you got to know that God is around you. Hear him again. And so, whenever he will I mean, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I mean, he's scared to death. We're fixing to, we're fixing to be, we're going to be leaving here. Come on now. I mean, there's no options here. They, they've outnumbered us, and Elisha just kind of turned over and yawned. I can see him doing that. He, he said, he, said uh, he just bowed his head and said, Lord, would you open this boy's eyes and let him see? And when he looked out the tent, all the area around the enemy, there was fiery chariots. Somebody hear what I'm saying? Woo, somebody hear me now. I told you the story here a while back of a time here in Hot Springs where we were invited to come somewhere. It was a seedy little motel on the other side of town that was known for their drug deals and all kinds of stuff going on. And we went over there, me and uh, Brother Ken Cannon, Sister Becky, you might remember that night. And I, I told Brother Doug on the way up there, I said, now, Brother, if this guy wants help, we're going to help him. But I'm not going to argue with him. I'm not going to placate him. I'm hungry. Our wives has already gone to the restaurant ahead of us, and I want to get there before they get all the hors d'oeuvres eat up. Somebody say amen. That's how, kind of how I felt. I didn't want to play no games. I was tired. I've been in the pulpit twice that day. I was exhausted. And, and here this guy called and said, I just want you to come and talk to me. I drive up out there, and, and uh, he comes out there, and he, and he kneels down at my door, and he says to me, he said, you know, there's something telling me to kill you right now. And, and I'm sitting there, and, and uh, you know, I remember, remember what I told Brother Doug. I want to put the thing in drive and hit the gas real fast. Somebody say amen right there. But he looks at me and said, aren't you afraid? And I said, no, sir, I'm not afraid. Why aren't you afraid? I said, because you can't kill me. That's why I'm not afraid. He said, why do you mean I can't kill you? I said, you can't kill me because God is here. Right. You hear what I'm saying? Now, now, I'm not anything special, ladies and gentlemen. You say, whoo, our pastor, he is so powerful. No, 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 no. Don't you misunderstand. That ain't what, that ain't what this is about. It's all about Jesus. Say amen right now. I'm just simply here to tell you that when you get yourself in a predicament where the enemy comes and speaks into your ear, you can understand that God is around you. Would you shout a good amen to that? During the course of our visit with him, some of, I didn't know who he was, but this guy kept coming out of the motel room and he started out there toward the van where we was at and he turned around and went back in the room and he come back out and he paced up and down the sidewalk and I'm watching him 
as I'm talking to this boy and watching this guy because I, I don't know where we're I don't know what's going to take place. I knew it's a bad part of town. I knew there's always police in, in there dealing with drug deals and drug busts and all kinds of stuff, domestic violence, guns, and all all that's there. Only thing we got is the Holy Ghost up in that van. Say amen to that. And I'm sitting there, Brother Doug, and I, I'm watching this guy. I had no idea who he was. We taking care of our business. He went up there and he stopped me as I was coming around by the room. He come back out of the room and stopped me. And I said, well, what did you forget? He said, well, my cousin, it, did you notice him coming out here and going back, coming out here and pacing? I said, yeah, I noticed that. I didn't know who he was. He said, that's my cousin. And said, my cousin's into witchcraft. He knows all the demons that are around here. And I said, okay. He said, he told me I need to quit and leave y'all alone. I need to quit messing with y'all. And I said, what are you talking about messing with him? He said, I don't know who it was. I don't know what it was. But there was some creature standing back behind that van that had eyes all the way around its head, had six wings. Somebody say amen. Stood up taller than that van was. I knew. I looked at Brother Doug. He looked at me as we drove off. I said, my Lord, Brother Doug, do you know who he saw? Do you know what he saw? I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, I recognize that Daniel saw the same thing. Somebody say amen. And God says he's going to be around about the children of God. Amen. Oh, I know. I know, ladies and gentlemen, that things are bad. I know our world is, is, is coming apart at the seams. But it ain't doing nothing that God's word didn't tell us was going to happen before he came back. Amen. Matthew 24 is being lived out right in front of us. But you've got to understand before he comes back to the earth the second time, he's going to come back in the clouds. Would somebody say, man, he's going to take us out of here. You know why? Because he's looking down and he said, I've not appointed you under wrath. Somebody hear the pastor tonight. I'm going to take you before it gets as bad as it could get. But don't you live your life in this idea that you're never going to have any trouble. Come on. Come on. Hell has been on you. Hell wants you back. Right. Whatever God delivered you from, Satan wants you back involved in the same thing. Right. Whatever it was. It doesn't make any difference what he brought you out of. Satan wants to take you back. Right. Amen. I was driving up to my dad's this afternoon, picking him up to bring him here in the service tonight. And there's not a lot of traffic on that little old lane that goes up to their house. And I thought to myself, as I drove up there, roots is bulging through the asphalt drive that they got built there. I said, it wouldn't take much at all if nobody was keeping this place up for the wilderness to take it over. Some time ago, I seen in Detroit, businesses and buildings and manufacturing warehouses where they used to build automobiles and steel mills. Trees are growing up through the concrete, broken into the buildings, growing up inside the buildings because nature is taking it back over. And I'm here today to tell you that's the same way it happens in our life spiritually. If we don't stay in the Word of God, stay close to God, stay prayed up, Amen. Hell will take us back just a little bit along. Amen. It'll start with a bad attitude. Amen. Next thing you know, you got bitterness in your heart over something you had no control over. And all God says is, trust me. Trust me. Keep looking at me. Keep hanging on to me. Don't you look to the left or to the right. He told us the first Sunday of the month, stay focused. Stay focused. Everything else will take care of itself. Now, the third thing that I want to share with you tonight, and I think I'm going to quit with this one. Now, I got about this many notes left. Will that be all right on number three? Brother Leo, that be all right. Brother Leo said that's fine. Now, the good Lord has told us in his word that he is above us. And we need to quit living our lives like something's happened to us that God didn't know about. And then he told us 
that he's around about us. He encamps around about those that fear him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And then I want you to look over in Exodus, one of my favorite books, chapter number 13. It said, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and by night. I like that. I love that. Now, in my, in my mind, I've got a picture. I don't know where it, what happened to it. It's probably still in there in that box of books that I can't find a place for. But I've got to find it. It's a picture of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And it's beautiful. I found it when I was in Branson years ago. Money was tight, but I talked my wife into letting me buy it anyhow. And I've had it in my office ever since. And every once in a while, Brother Kenny, I'll look at it because it reminds me of the glory of God in the midst of his people. Amen. And I, in my mind, I can see as he's leading them out. Y'all remember we talked to you here a while back about Rahab? And Rahab said, we heard about y'all, and when we heard about y'all, our hearts didn't melt within us. Fear gripped their hearts because they heard what God had done in the midst of Israel. Amen. Amen. And I can imagine that they will look down over some of those hills and maybe see Israel camped out in their journey. On a beautiful, cloudless day, there's a pillar of cloud that coming up over that old ugly tent just shooting up into the sky as far as the eye can see that's bad enough to strike fear in anybody that's on lookers and looking at that but man could you imagine what it would be like in the dead of night huh when everything was so calm and so quiet to look over the breast of that mountain top and see that shoot of fire that comes from that tent not consuming the tent but it's coming from the tent going as far as the eye can see up into the glorious heavens come on church I'm telling you crazy if that don't affect you you hear what I'm saying ain't nobody got to preach no sermon Ain't nobody got to say nothing. Ain't nobody got to do nothing. Ain't nobody got to warn you about nothing. All you got to do is see that. And when you see that, it's going to affect you somehow or another. Come on now. It's, if you're a child of God, it ought to make you want to shout in the camp. Would you say amen to that? Amen. That God has taken so much of an interest there with us that he has gone before us. Now it said that the cloud led them by day and the fire led them by night. What does it say? God is before me. Are, are y'all with me? <laughs> ah, you, you, you see, I don't have to wonder if God's taking me in the place that I'm supposed to go because he's already been where I'm at. Come on now. He's already been where I'm at. He's already, he already knew the lay of the land. He already knew that. My grandpa used to farm whenever he was a young man. And he didn't have tractors. He had mules. And grandpa would take the old seasoned mule. Somebody say amen for the seasoned mule. Now, I don't know when, but sometime in my life, Brother Nelson, I became the seasoned mule. I don't, I don't know when. I just woke up one day, and I was old and gray-headed. And I'd see where God would bring some young whippersnapper mule up beside me and hook him in the harness with me. And he'd say, I want y'all to plow this field together. Amen. And Brother Doug, <laughs> I didn't want to plow with some ignorant mule that didn't know nothing. 
And I said to Grandpa, I said, Grandpa, why do you put that young mule or that young horse with that old mule? And he said, well, if you'll just stand here and watch a little while, I'll show you. And he'd tell old Peanut to get up and go, and Peanut would hook that thing up. He'd sink that old buckeye down in that mud and that dirt. He'd begin to turn that dirt. And that young horse, that young pony over there next to him would begin to kind of kick against the traces and kick against the, are you seeing what I'm saying? And I said, Grandpa, why is he doing it? He said, because he's young and he's dumb. That's what he said. I'm not trying to be ugly. Now, don't misunderstand me. Brother Pack is not trying to be ugly. But you see, the young pony didn't know what the seasoned mule knew. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So what God is trying to show us, he said, you don't have to worry about where you're being led because he that has gone before you knows the field. You see what I'm saying? See, the seasoned mule, he knew where every hard spot was at. He knew where there had been any stumps, that there might be some roots left down in there somewhere. He knew where there would be some rocks. He knew where that it would be a little bit soft. He knew where that it would be easy pulling. He knew the lay of the field. He had worked the field long enough that he knew the field. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And what amazes me as a pastor is how that sometimes we get this idea that we know more about the field than God does. <laughs> Y'all are pitiful. <laughs> Lord, now you see this bunch. My pastor used to tell me, said, I'm going to tell the Holy Ghost on you. <laughs> I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just saying how easy it is for us to forget that it's God that knows the field. It's God that knows what needs to happen, when it needs to happen, how it needs to happen. And when I run ahead of him, I'm kicking out of the traces. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Whenever I'm, whenever I'm trying to impose my will, I'm kicking against the traces. And he said to Saul of Tarsus, he said, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, isn't it? Amen. You know what he was trying to do? He's trying to see Saul. He said, Saul, he said, if you're ever going to become Paul, you've got to learn that it's me that's in charge. And while you've got all this knowledge and you've got all this wisdom and you've got all this understanding, you've got to learn to cast all that aside and you've got to trust me that I'm going to lead you in the direction that you need to go. Would y'all say amen to that? Amen. Amen. How many of you know that God knows what we need, when we need, and how we need it? And he, and he said, son, he said, I want you to trust me. He said, I'm going to lead you in a way that you're not, you've never been before. You've never been there. Whenever they got ready to cross over the Red Sea, he said, you have never been this way before. That's all right. The cloud's going. Somebody say amen. The fire's going to lead us. That ark is going to carry us. The presence of God is going to show us the way. They put their faith in action, ladies and gentlemen, is what I'm trying to say. There's a story in 2 Kings chapter number 7, verse, we find four leprous men sitting at the gate of Samaria. Y'all remember those guys? They were sitting there. They were just waiting to die. Now, when the Bible says that they were leprous men, that's a, that's a bad indictment. Would you agree with that? That's about a hopeless situation right there. Anybody here ever seen a leper? Let me see your hands. I have. 
Let me tell you, it ain't, it ain't nothing pretty. They carry a shame that's attached with that disease. It, it eats their fingers and their toes and their nose and their ears off. Just the, just the, just, just pitiful. You see those old Bible pictures where they got those cloths wrapped around their head. They still do. They still do. There's medication that has been produced that helps with it, but there's no cure for it. I think they've, they've got a cure for it, but once you've got it, there's nothing they can do but, but treat you. And so down in South Louisiana, there was a leper colony. It was the only one in the continental United States, and at one time they were talking about moving them to Hawaii. They didn't want to go because their family and their friends had been buried on that compound. So when I say there's four leprous men here, I mean, just that statement alone was enough to strike fear to anybody's heart. But I'm talking about the leadership of God. Now, notice something here. They knew that if they went back into the city that they were going to die because there was a famine in the land and the enemy was there in front of them. And so somebody said, why are we going to sit here all day until we die? You know what they said? They come up with a plan. They said, we're going to surrender ourselves to the enemy. That's what we're going to do. And, and yeah, maybe before they kill us, they'll feed us a bologna sandwich or something. You understand what I'm saying? They were starving to death. And so they began to put their faith in action. And they began to get up on their feet. And I don't know how it happened, ladies and gentlemen, but God caused their stumbling and bumbling around to get up on their feet and to walk toward that city to sound like an innumerable troops that was coming into the enemy's camp. And the scripture said that they up and left everything where it lay and left running I'm talking about the leadership of God. Now, I don't know about you. Here they are, they're outside the city. They won't let them back in the city because they're lepers. They're stuck on the outside. The enemy's up in front of them. And they said, well, let's just go on down to the enemy's camp. We're going to give ourselves up. And God did a miracle in that because of their faith. And as they begin to move, things begin to happen, and they begin to leave everything. All of their supplies is there. How would you have liked to have been on the inside of that city and one of those old lepers walked back down to the city gate where you was at and said, I know that y'all didn't want us to come in there and be a part of y'all because of we got this treacherous disease, but we've got some sandwiches down here, and we've got some milk, and we've got some crackers, and we got some cheese, and we got a, what, what, where did you? Well, they're gone. We don't know where they go, but they're gone is all I know. And we've got plenty. If y'all want to have something to eat, come on down. Y'all getting what I'm saying here? Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say to you today is the person that's out there that's willing to put their faith in action and follow the direction of the Lord, that God is able to make a way where there doesn't seem to be any way at all. God is able to show up strong on your path, on your behalf. And what you've got to do is quit worrying about the enemy, quit worrying about what they're going to do, quit worrying about what they're going to say, and just simply say, to God, this is it. I'm going to put myself in your hands. I'm going to move out at your direction and whatever it is that you have, whatever your plan is for me, I'm going to accomplish that by the help and by the grace of God. And to see what God may do in your life. I'm going to close with this, but let me just tell you this. I was thinking the other day when I seen on the news, and I'll be honest with you, I had to get a hold of myself. I don't need to watch the news. I get mad. I, I, I get mad. I, listen, I know some politicians ought to be shot for treason. That's just all I'll say. They just... Brother Doug, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, I said, now God, those people over there, those Afghans that have worked shoulder to shoulder for 20 plus years with our men and women in, in uniform, those Americans that have been over there trying to help a situation that's bad, got left behind.
And I think we need to pray that God would somehow do a miracle to get them out of there. How many of you know God can do it without us? Huh? God can do it, ladies and gentlemen. But you know what I realized? I can't pray the prayer of faith if I'm wasting all of my time being angry. And so I've got to let God do the leading, don't I? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Sister Becky, would you come up and just place something, whatever the Lord lays on your heart? My voice is about shot. Can y'all tell that? Old Jordan sitting over there. Y'all know what y'all know what he's thinking. His voice is about shot. I'm glad. Jordan, that ain't what you're thinking, is it? <laughs> oh, I love it. Them them young folks, they'll tell you the straight of it, won't they? See, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I want you to have some answers when the devil comes to you next time. And he says, where's your God at? I want you to remember that he's watching down. He's looking down. I want you to remember that everywhere you look, you may not can see them, but they're there. They're all around us. Our, our people may have been forsaken in Afghanistan, but we've never been forsaken. David said, I was one time young and now I'm an old man. And he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor see begging bread. How awesome is our God, ladies and gentlemen. When he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you, he meant that. He meant that. I don't know where you're at and I don't know what's going on in your life. I know what's been going on in mine, and I know how tired that I've been. I know how emotionally weary that I've been. But you know what? He's got my back. He's leading the way. He's leading the way. Years ago, in a very dark time of my life, our life, we were in a service. There was a preacher friend of mine. He was, I guess we considered ourselves friends. We didn't run together. We didn't hang out together. We didn't eat out together, nothing like that. But we were friends and we knew one another. And I went into the service where he was preaching that morning as a visitor. My wife and myself and my family sat down on the pew and he come over to where I was at and he didn't know anything about what was going on but he said to me he said brother Pack, I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to tell you something God sees where you are and he said I see you like you're walking down a trail that's just got vines wrapped all around your legs and around your chest area and you're pushing and you're chopping and you're pushing and you're chopping and he said vegetation seems to be so thick you can't get through it he said the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell you that there is light it's about to break forth in your life and you're about to get through this jungle you know why he could say that because he knew who was leading the way everything's going to be all right I don't know. I don't know who you are. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what prayers you're praying. I don't know what I know. I know some of your circumstances. I, I mean, I do know that. I'm your pastor. Sometimes I'm your pester. You know, meddle, meddle, meddler. I get paid to do that, by the way. But I'm going to tell you tonight. On the authority of the Word of God, as long as we let Him lead the way, He'll get us through the vines, He'll get us through the bushes, He'll get us through the jungle. 
And out of nowhere, out of nowhere, Sister Deborah, we're going to break through and there's going to be a light that shines plainly on the path and we're going to be able to walk with ease. And I don't know how long it'll last because the Bible said about Jesus when the enemy attempted him after 40 days and 40 nights he came to him and tempted him. And whenever the Lord defeated him with the word of God, the Bible said that Satan left him for a season tells me that he's coming back and we know that in reading and studying the life of Jesus that he came back and he's been to me and he's came back and he's been to me again and he's came back he's done the same thing in your life why because he knows you're on the right track he knows you're on the right track he knows you're walking up the king's highway would you say a good amen to that I think it was Sister Jana was talking to me the other day and she said, Brother Pike said, the Bible still says it's straight as a gate and narrow as the way. Few there are that find it. But on the opposite side said, broad is the gate and broad is the way that leads to death and destruction. You hear what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? Don't you buy into this stuff that if you're having troubles, you're outside the will of God. Don't you buy that trash. I'm here to tell you, if you're walking in the will of God, you may be having troubles. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you today for the Word of God. I thank you for the sweet anointing of the Holy Spirit that's been in this place all day long. Master, we thank you today because we know that you certainly do sit on the throne room above us and you ever sit at the right hand of the Father living to make intercession for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you said you were encamped round about those of us that believe. I know that you sent your angels. They are ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. God, we don't run around here looking for angels at every turn. We're not looking for some kind of an angelic being. We just want to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. They're going to do their job the same way we're going to do ours. And I just want to thank you, Lord, for sending them our way. And I want to thank you, Lord, today for leading us down the right path. I thank you, Lord, that even during those times of heartache and hardship and times of tears and agony of soul, that you promised us you'd never leave us nor forsake us. I want to thank you tonight, God, that we can know that we're on the King's Highway simply because we put our faith and confidence and our trust in you. There's a fire that leads us, God, by night. There's a light that leads us, the cloud that leads us by day. The presence and the anointing and the glory of God has always been the same. You're still God, Lord. You've never changed, and you never will. I thank you for that, and I thank you for the confidence that we can have in that. In the midst of a time when everybody's looking for something that they don't know what they're looking for, I'm glad that you opened the eyes of those of us that are here so that we could see. Now I pray that you help us to help somebody else's eyes to be open so they can see, so they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus and make him Lord of their lives. I pray this in Jesus' name.